book, he's got a picture of him in an American T-5 parachute, you know, jumping under the name of Martino Papalone. <laughs> so, that was, it's all my way of saying the old spirit gets to you, you know. <laughs> Okay, so we're rolling? Yeah, oh, Okay, um, if you could give me your name and where you're from. Yeah, I'm Carl Beck. Uh, I was born and raised in a little town called Avondale, Missouri, right hard by the Kansas border. And I've lived in Atlanta since retirement from the Army in 1963. Um, when did you first go in the military? 1942, in December of 1942, I was uh, barely 17, or barely, and uh, born in 1925, by the way. And so I sort of borrowed my brother's age, uh, with my parents' permission, of course, because they knew I was going to join something. And uh, I joined uh, Airborne, and uh, went to Tacoa, arriving there in December of 1942, and uh, took our airborne basic training there at Tacoa, about uh, 12 weeks, I think it was. Uh, the pipeline back in those days was to go basic training, Benning for jump school, McCall for advanced training, and then overseas, whether it's the Pacific or, or to Europe. We, uh, I was in the 501 Regiment of the 101st, and uh, we ended up in Europe, and uh, arriving in Scotland, actually, in uh, 1944, January 1944. So, um, back before that, do you remember where you were, where you were, and what you thought about Pearl Harbor? I sure do. I, of course, you know this is a little hard to travel town back during the Depression. You know everybody was poor. I mean, uh, you know, we lived in a house with no electricity and an outside uh, uh, facility. Uh, uh, we'd get uh, we'd butcher hogs during school. We'd get out of school to go from house to house, raise chickens, uh, shoot rabbits, you know, uh, to make a living. Uh, but yet, everybody was in the same situation. You know, we didn't know we were poor. Everybody was the same same way. I remember Pearl Harbor that uh, was a Sunday, and uh, we had uh, we had this high school or grade school, and uh, we used to kind of ease in through the coal chute and get up and shoot hoops. You know, so uh, we kind of everybody knew about it. You know, so uh, uh, we were coming back from that uh, from that little expedition. And that's when we heard about Pearl Harbor. And of course, you know, people say, well, you know, going to attack us, going to hit, where's Pearl Harbor? You know, first of all, that is kind of the big question. You know, we, you know, we said, well, you know, come on, let's get the Army and the Navy and all this out there, and let's go whoop them. We're going to whoop up on these guys. You turn around, you look around, and where's the Army and Navy? We didn't have one, right? So uh, that was kind of a disappointment to us. And. Uh, you got to realize that this was at the height of the Depression. Uh, you might say it was beginning to ease a little bit, but it 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 meant that uh, this this wave of patriotism swept the land. I mean, I personally, and I think most of my contemporaries, would rather do anything than get called 4F. You know, that, I mean, everybody was joining the service. That was the thing to do. You know, that was one of the reasons I sort of borrowed my brother's age and uh, uh, joined the Airborne. And uh, that's pretty much what it was like. You, you, you got to kind of judge it by the times that uh, everybody was kind of poor and hung together. And uh, that's kind of, like they say, the way it was. Uh, and and. Again, this wave, it's hard to describe this wave of patriotism uh, that, that swept the land at, at that time. Uh, everybody went in the service, everybody that I knew. It might have, it might have been a better, <laughs> better to get away from the Depression. I, some people will tell you that, but that's, that's really not true. So. Um, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about your training. Well, we uh, arrived in Tacoa. Uh, in December, like I said, December 1942, and uh, the idea of Airborne Basic was to put all the pressure on you that you could. 
every mental kind of physical pressure they could and make you want to fight. I mean, they would just flat make you uh, do anything to wipe people out. And I'm proud to say that those of us who survived that training in Tekoa, uh not a one of us washed out of jump school because we washed them out first. And this is pretty much the way we find now that Green Berets and Rangers are training now that to get your people that are not going to make it, get them out of there. And we had a mountain up there called Curahy. It's three and a half miles up and three and a half miles back. And we would run up Curahy, you know, at least once a week. And I mean, one time we would run around the tri tri uh, quadrangle uh, one Saturday morning just to see how many times we could make. We ran and ran and ran and uh, of course we were late for breakfast and uh, I ended up with one prune, okay? But you know, you, you don't complain, you just keep on going. And, and this was part of the training. Uh, we had a quarry run that we went down this old railroad bank. Again, it was around seven miles round trip. The, uh, we had only had light, uh, light packs and individual weapons. We didn't have cruiser weapons. Well, one time a rumor got out that this lieutenant had fallen out, a platoon leader. And people don't fall out. When he found out about that, we got our mortars and machine guns and he ran us down that thing and back, you know, until we, our tongues were hanging out. And uh, McCall is another example of how they're, even after jump training, we had a commanding officer, the 501, called Howard Johnson. He was a legend. Uh, we called him Jumpy. He loved to jump out of airplanes. Old Jumpy would get up on the back end of a deuce and a half truck and say, you know, he would harangue the whole regiment. Then he, you know, say, what are we here for? And you were supposed to respond by saying, fight, okay? Well, we got to using uh, words like uh, furlough and other F words. Uh, and when he found out about that, he ran us around that quadrangle until our tongues hung out. From then on, what were we there for? What's the fight? You know? and so, and that was Jumpy's way of, uh, of, of getting us some additional training, you might say. Uh, so that, uh, but that was the kind of leadership we had too. I don't want you to be mistaken about this because those officers and NCOs that we had were just first class people. And they'd get you in and they'd try their best to get you out. And uh, I can't say enough for that leadership. Um, <clears throat> once you got to England, um, there was still a lot of training to do there. Oh yeah, we made, uh, we made four night jumps. Uh, over this period of time from January to June. Uh, usually, well, the last of the four jumps, we flew at night around Bristol, the channel over the uh, Irish Sea, turned around over Bristol, and it's fortunately it was a night you could look back and see just miles and miles of C-47s dragging gliders. And we would turn then, and this whole armada would turn back around, and we'd jump about four miles away from the drop zone or the airport that we took off from. And uh, they were all night jumps, so and that was the purpose of Normandy at that time was to uh, was to go in at night. And uh, like I say, the four night jumps were uh, kind of took its toll on us, but uh, again, we survived and we were better for it. Uh, so that was. Uh, by the time we got ready to go to Normandy, of course, you hear all sorts of rumors about what's going to happen. We went into a thing called a marshalling area, which is uh, at the end of the airport. And it's like going into a medium security prison. You can get in, but you can't get out. The food's pretty good, too. I didn't, didn't mind that at all. But that's where we got briefed on where we were going to drop. Uh, and we stayed in that marshalling area, of course, until we did take off. Well, it was during this time that uh, after we were briefed that uh, uh, Jumpy Johnson uh, in his typical aggressive manner jumped up on, he had a buoy knife, he was about that long, it was kind of like a short sword. And uh, he jumped up on the back of the deuce and a half and pulled that knife out and said, I hope to plunge this in the heart of the dirtiest bastard in France. You know, and everybody, hey, 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 you know, let's go. Uh, and, uh, but we had a wonderful company commander named McKegg. 
And uh, we marched back to our tents and he just made the simple statement. You know, he said, uh, I wouldn't trade places with any son of a bitch in the world. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> kind of grabbed you. And uh, that's pretty well how he felt about it. Well, of course, we ended up loading the airplanes on the equipment bundles and so forth on the 5th of June. You understand it was double daylight savings time. And although it was 11 o'clock at night when we took off, the cameras and all were still running because you could, you know, it was still, it was only about four hours of darkness in those latitudes at that time of year anyway. So that's why you could see the, the uh, airplanes taking off. So that when we took off from a place called Wolford Park, it's about uh, near a little town called Lambourne, uh, about up the Thames River, biggest town I guess is Swindon nearby. And uh, we flew then generally south over the channel and made a turn to come over the Cokenton Peninsula, kind of in a northerly direction. Well, as soon as we hit the coast, we hit a cloud bank. And back in those days, you had a C-47 and V of V's, three, three, and three. That would be, you know, it took nine planes to haul a company. Well, the lead plane had the Rebecca, which was emitting to the, and receiving a, a, a device, a hand crank device for the pathfinders. Well, when we hit the cloud bank, the, descent, the formation disintegrated pretty badly. Then we started picking up 20 millimeter fire. We were at 800 feet actual altitude, and that's murder. 20 millimeter fires, it lethal, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's all kinds of colors and bright. Well, our airplane got hit, and when your plane got hit, it sounded like it's like your head's in a bucket and somebody's pounding on the bucket. Well, supposedly you're supposed to get like a 20-minute green uh, red light, stand up, hook up, and get all your equipment ready to go. And 20 minutes later, you should get a green light. Well, all we got was a bell because it meant to get out of that airplane. So we tossed the bundle out. And everybody went out. We all got out. I, I don't know what happened to the airplane except that it did go down. And uh, but this time, a big, beautiful moon shining. And when I got my, went out of the airplane, I got my opening shock, checked your canopy, turned my head. I saw the little double headed light we had attached to the equipment bundle. And had a little piece of cardboard under the clip so when it got that prop blast it would go away and that light would come, a very dim blue light. And I turned and I saw that bundle hit the ground. And I had always been on that bundle first in train, always. But when I got on the ground my parachute went over the top of some trees and my feet were kind of up in the air in this ditch and my fanny was swinging about that far from the ground. And I pulled out my jump knife and cut my way out of this old T5 parachute that had the harnesses that buckled, you know, and all that weight on it, my weight coming down. But I never saw that bundle again. And 16,000 men dropped on that peninsula that night. And I found one, my friend Robert Johnson from Oklahoma, from my company. And the way I spotted uh, Robert, I heard somebody, and I, you ever skyline somebody? A skyline, he had a World War I band about that long on his end of his rifle, and I spotted him. Of course, you understand, we had all kinds of passwords and stuff, you know, like signs, like babe, countersign, Ruth, ham, eggs, signs and countersign. We had one that said whistle, thunderer, sign and countersign. It wasn't until years later that I discovered that that was sort of fine-tuning things because the Germans don't have a W. They have a double V for whistle. They don't have a TH sound. They got a t it, so their version of it would be whistle thunder. Okay, so that was kind of. I mean, you're kind of fine-tuning things that way. Of course, we had a clicker too that was up here in this, along with a. Uh, with a uh, jump knife. Of course, when I cut my way out of the parachute, I 
you know, through the toss the knife away. What you're supposed to do is once you hear somebody say, one click, here I am, I hear you. And that was the sign and countersign. With all these signs and countersigns and all this, I knew that was Robert Johnson to come across that field. So I said, hey, Johnson, <laughs> and uh, let him know, you know, that uh, we were there. And I joined with him and we wandered around for several days dodging German patrols and about every time we would move, they'd start shooting. We'd always sworn we're going to take some with us. And I'll tell you one story that kind of sums it all up for the several days that we were wandering around. About daylight one morning, we'd come through this uh, gate in the hedgerow where the farmer would get in and work his, uh, his uh, cattle and stuff. And we heard this German patrol coming. So we got down in the corner of a hedgerow where it formed a 90 degree angle, black bear briars going around. And Johnson got down the instant and we made kind of a spoon and I had an M1 rifle between my knees. We had always sworn we were going to take some with us when we come out of there. Well, this patrol came through the same gate that we had just come through, and they had a dog. And that dog stuck his head in that briar platch about that far from that rifle. He stuck his head in there, sniffed around, and turned around and walked off. I guess we smelled so bad <laughs> that, that he decided not, not to bark or not to let anyone know we were there. So you'd call that God or fate or kismet or whatever, but uh, we got lucky on that one. Well, by the time these, we had wandered around for several days, these jumpsuits, by the way, this is a replica of the 1942 jumpsuit that we had made when we went back in D plus 50 years in 1994. We had OD trousers and shirts under uh, woolens under these jumpsuits, and these things were in rags by that time. So about four o'clock one afternoon, we heard these French people in this orchard, work in the orchard, men and women. Well, Robert said, okay, well, I'll stand up, you cover me, we'll, we'll see what happens. We understand we were the color of mud, and these uh, 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 jumpsuits were just in rags. Well, when Robert stood up, French people babble. You know, they babble. Bless them. And uh, this woman looked up and saw Robert. And she went, you know, like, it would have been kind of funny if it had been so serious. So finally, this babble kind of went away. And uh, we still didn't know who they were. They knew who we were. So this one gentleman named Le Forestier, who was the oldest uh, inheritor or whatever of, of this group at a place called La Sablonge. You understand the Normans stay on these uh, farms for generations. He motioned us for us to come on and he carried us a circuitous route and carried us to this old barn. Went up in the hayloft and pulled a ladder behind. Well, he'd come up in the afternoons for two or three days and he'd have eggs and boiled eggs and potatoes and he'd feed us. And we were so starving, we'd push our flesh in and it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't come back out. Uh, so we were in pretty bad shape. And they came to get us one morning. And we figured that, you know, we've had it. But he carried us around a trail and the 508 Regiment from the 82nd had just crossed the Douve River and we joined with their F Company and uh, took this town of Balp. We ran into quite a bit of resistance. Uh, went into this little town, knocked out a 20 millimeter gun, went up through the back of this house and there was a little tank came through this street. And uh, these streets are not very wide. And we had a thing called a gambling grenade. It's made out of composition C plastic explosive. And, uh, and you could stuff all the C2 under there you wanted, you know. And this tank came by and these little old narrow streets I got my gambling grenade out and I threw that thing and I missed the tank. It went all the way over and hit the wall on the other side and blew it out. And Robert said, let me, don't oh mind, but this time the tank is by it. And he tossed his, hit it on the turret, bowed that turret in, and wouldn't you believe a German soldier got the back, <laughs> came, you know, the back hatch came down and he went, not took a couple of shots at him, but it, he ran in the garden, of course, somebody, somebody shot him. And we, in turn, moved across this street and we had a 
mouse trap behind the railroad track and the water was real high and they couldn't get out and uh, we shot them up pretty good and they, they decided to, to surrender. And uh, that pretty well in well, of course we had to go back to our outfit and they had just finished taking Carentan. I think it's interesting that uh, when we go back in uh, 2004, this year in June, we're invited to uh, the ceremony of the liberation of Carentan, which is the biggest town nearby. And I just found out by letter from the mayor of this little town of Vault that uh, they want me to come back for their liberation day, which happens to be on the 13th. You see, I, we didn't even know what day it was, you know, <laughs> much less the date. Uh, so we'll go back in 1990, uh, this year and uh, get a jump in. We're going to do D plus uh, 60 years and uh, get that, get that, uh, renew old acquaintances. I've got about 60 people coming for dinner. I'm going to cater for them. But uh, I, I got to tell you this, that right at currently there's a great deal of strain between us and the French. But I've always looked at the Normans as as we look at the southeastern United States, we're loyal Americans, they're loyal French. But you know, we're just a little bit different, okay? Because Kyle, I gotta tell you, there were dozens of people in this little town that knew we were in that barn. They never told. And uh, I've been forever grateful. So just to make a long story short, I look at them as my friends and, you know, at one time we had an alliance with them. But alliances kind of come and go. But friendships forever. Well, we rejoined our unit then at Hill 30 in, near Carentan. Did some scouting and patrolling with uh, tanks and combat patrols going out shooting up the countryside pretty good. And uh, went back to England and uh, got ready to go to Holland. and. Uh, in the meantime, you may have heard of Private Ryan, who was a guy named uh, Fritz Nyland, the NCO in our company, who had, uh, while we were at Carrington, they heard his brother got killed in the 505 Regiment in the 82nd, and uh, Father Sampson got, and back in those days, they interred people in, uh, in their mattress cover, and were pretty much wherever they fell. You get people together, grave registration people. I can't say enough for these people, Carl, because if you're not identified when you're KIA killed in action, then you're missing in action. I mean, it, unless you're positively identified. Well, Father Sampson had this roster and had uh, Robert Nyland's name on it. And Father Sampson said, well, you know what, I'll find Robert. I don't find Olin. I mean, and Fritz says, well, that's my other brother. So, Make a long story short, Father Sampson says, you're going home. Fritz says, I'm not going to go home. But this time we're back in England, getting staged to go to Holland. And uh, Fritz heard that his third brother had been shot down in uh, Burma. And it happened he had been captured by the Japanese and escaped. And he wandered around with those tribes people for two years because, you know, he couldn't get the word out. And of course, by this time, the War Department said, okay, Fritz, you're, you're going to go home. And uh, Fritz went on home. He practiced dentistry in Alaska and passed away not long ago. His daughter still comes to our regimental reunions. And uh, so that's the kind of NCOs that we had, too, I might add. That's the quality of people that we had, like Fritz Nyland and Father Sampson. Well, well, to continue the story, we took some further training replacement in England so that in September, we jumped in a place called Hell's Highway, uh, going north, taking this supply route, going north from Holland across Belgium, Holland. The idea was to cross the Rhine River where the Rhine turns in Holland, it big splits and becomes the Dieter Rhine and the Wall. And that's where the story of the bridge too far comes in. You may have heard of that. Well, we jumped near Eindhoven and took Hell's Highway in our part of it. We were the southernmost division. 82nd was up around Nijmegen. Arnhem was the sixth, uh, sixth uh, British, first British uh, uh, parachute division. And uh, they got all shot up pretty badly. And uh, we ended up around Thanksgiving of 1944 going across the Rhine 
getting those people. Well, we patrolled across the Rhine, contacted the Dutch underground, and uh, but in the meantime, we were cut off up there. And uh, although we were the southernmost division near Eindhoven, uh, one night we made a night attack on this town called Schindel. And if you ever, when you were a kid, you ever hold your hand in front of your face and you can't see it, it's so dark. That's how dark it was. Well, we got lined up. We were going to knock out these two 40-gauge guns that were a coast artillery cannon that we were going to turn around on us. So our company led off, and uh, uh, we, the thing probably that impressed me as much as anything about that battle, it was so dark. For the first time in my life, I saw tracers meet. You know, you know, I mean, tracers look like streetcars coming, you know, that, 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 the bad news. And uh, that was one of the things that impressed me. And then my good friend Roy Morgan got shot through the ear. And my buddy Bones Watt set a barn on fire and got it, things lighted up. And Roy was bleeding, you know, he was, oh, he's bleeding like a stuck hog, you know, and he get him back to the aid station. So we went on, took this town. Two other companies went out, knocked out those guns, put thermite grenades in the breach. And that day we went back to uh, Rarity, this little town near Eindhoven. Well, would you believe Roy Morgan shows up in a day or two? And you know, at night you can never tell how bad somebody's hit. Well, Roy had been shot through the earlobe. He came out of his helmet. And uh, his ears were ringing two or three days later. So uh, he thought, you know, the guy would say, well, yeah, Roy, I hear your ears ringing. So he thought I'd set him straight. You know. So he'd come up and say, Becky, you hear my ears ringing? I'd say, yeah, yeah, Roy, I, I can hear your ears ringing. You know? so, but good old Roy got hit in the butt and bastone and got evacuated. But uh, anyway, those are the kind of things that stick in your mind. I, I, don't, I don't know why. Uh, uh, one German tank was way up this railroad track, about 2,000 yards away. The thing curved around. and. We couldn't find that sucker. I mean, he had shoot us up, and we just couldn't find him. And we told this uh, British tank commander. He had a, a M4 tank. It was the first one I'd seen. It was an American tank. British crew, 76 millimeters stuck out with the fly, uh, the uh, smoke evacuators. First one of those I'd ever seen. And. Uh, we told him, you know, about going across this railroad track. There's a tank up there, an SP gun. We don't know where he's at. And they said, well, I'll take a look, Yank. He buttoned up in that tank, and he hadn't many more than got across his first railroad track, and that guy put three rounds in him. And the f one of the rounds went through that turret, 88 millimeter, hit the breech block on that 76, and split it all the way out to the outside. And that tank just sat there and smoked for a little while. Well, a couple of days later, that guy decided to come out. And what he had done, we couldn't find him with our air power or anything. He dug out the back side of a house, and that tank was firing out the door, right up that railroad track. You know, a great field of fire. Well, he decided to come out of there, and he did, house and all. He came along our line, shooting us up pretty good, and everybody not a hole, because that sucker was a royal tiger. I mean, he had treads about that wide, and uh, we just let him go where he wanted to go. <laughs> and uh, well, again, those are the kind of things that stick in your mind. Uh, uh, I will say that Holland was. Well, you've heard, like I say, of a bridge too far, and uh, uh, it was, uh, I guess, a failure as far as militarily goes, but we held the ground where we were supposed to, and uh, Dutch Underground contacted the British across Arnhem, across the bridge too far. And about Thanksgiving of 1944, the uh, Canadian engineers went across the Rhine with uh, these big boats and picked up these uh, uh, survivors of the British First Division. We had one guy, Lieutenant, <laughs> one we called Bear Tracks, and the other one, Rabbit Tracks. Well, <laughs> Bear Tracks was a kayak. Right? He told you know, he went across the Rhine in a kayak one night to get these British things, and he picked up this British Sergeant Major and put him on the kayak, and they were going to roll back. We lost the paddle, and we were in this old brick factory in an outpost looking over the Rhine, and at the time the engineers were going across to get these guys. We heard him hollering for help as he went down, and they, of course he went 
they ended up in the Zyder Z. Uh, both of them were, were dead, but uh, uh, that was kind of kind of people we had, and they were real risk takers. And you know, when you cross in a rubber boat, when you're going across a river, everybody had a Tommy gun and an oar. And somebody, one of the nights we went across, somebody says, "There's a power boat coming up the river." And you could barely make a, out a wake. It looked like a wake of a boat coming. Down. Everybody dropped a paddle and grabbed a squirt gun. And as we went by this thing, a Lancaster bomber had been shot down, and his tail was stuck. It was, it was head down in the in the in the uh, Rhine, and its tail was stuck up. And the current going by made it look like a wake of a boat. Because see, you're not moving; the bank is moving, you know. And uh, that's the kind of the odd bill part about it. But uh, we ran patrols across the Rhine for several days to, with the Dutch underground, trying to get those uh, those people out. So. Uh, we were only supposed to stay about 30 days in Holland. Of course, we stayed 72 days on the line, and uh, we returned. Well, we went to France then and started getting our replacements and so forth. And by this time, uh, you know, I was 19 years old, and uh, I remember I got a pass to go to Paris, and uh, it's been so long ago I've forgotten what a 19-year-old does in Paris. Uh, I do recall that when we got back to this place called Mormonon, about daylight one morning, here come these big old trucks. They're like uh, uh, eighteen wheelers with no top on them. You know, they like haul grain or lumber or something in them. You know, come out, well, get out and get on those trucks. Crouch are just up the road. And so, you know, I don't need this. <laughs> you know, so uh, okay. Well, anyway, we got on these trucks, had a tarp over the top of it, and executive officer came by on his jeep and says. Mount the machine guns on <clears throat> on the side. The crouch, you know, just up the road. Okay, you know, so we didn't know from zilch what's happening. And uh, we rode about two days on those trucks. Ended up south of a town called Bastogne, and uh, got off the trucks and double time through the town. The only orders that we had was move out and develop the situation. So. We took off kind of to the east of the town, and uh, one of our companies, I Company, took this town of Warden and got mouse trapped in there, and they lost 96 people <coughs> that first day, and it was pretty brutal for a little while till we got inside the perimeter. And if you were looking at a clock, and you know the center would be Bastogne. We were at about uh, from one o'clock to three o'clock with the 501 regiment, and you know 327 and the 502 and 506 made the perimeter. And just one fairly typical battle. Again, the thing that sticks in your mind: our platoon was back in reserve, and we got hit. It was 22nd of December, real cold, miserable night, fog. You put up an 81 mortar flare, and all it would do is just kind of glow, it wouldn't light, you just couldn't see. And uh, they hit us pretty hard. Machine gun section got knocked out with a, on a haystack, and my company commander said, you better get, get your machine gun, get out, get out there, you know, and, and fire that final protective line. And, uh, you know, you're looking at those tracers going by, and you say, up there? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I got my rope through this barbed wire, and, uh, you know, I had an A6 machine gun on, on a bipod, and as I set it down, the 31 caliber bullet went bouncing off the bipod, and uh, you know I almost came home with a soprano voice. But you know, and, and I kept that old bipod leg for so long because it made an indent, you know, and it changed the color of the thing. And uh, I stayed out there and fired that uh, fine protective fire, and they left me a hand grenade off the end of my machine gun muzzle and kind of butted me up and. Went back to the aid station. There's no hospital, and you know, Crouch had overrun our hospital and you know, laid there all night. And uh, there had been a uh, a tank destroyer. There were some of these armored outfits were mouse trapped in there with us, and this thing was situated to where he could swing the turret around with a 76 millimeter gun and keep his hull in what we call turret defilade. His, his, his hull is down in this cut thing. And he'd been firing a 50 caliber machine gun out of the ring mount on that uh, turret. 
Well, when I got hit, it went back to the aid station laying there on a stretcher. And here come this gunner out of that tank destroyer. He had a 31 caliber bullet up in his nose. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, when, when the world happened to you? Uh, uh, well, he says, he saw that burst coming, and when he ducked, he saw those tracers coming. One of the rounds hit the ring mount and bounced down and hit him in the nose. <laughs> but uh, uh, he got lucky, and so did I, I guess. But the uh, next day, I went back to the line. There wasn't any place to go, and there were 72 dead out there. So we, we stopped them pretty, pretty close. And as far as our group goes, we, we didn't take too many casualties inside the, while we were in the perimeter. We used to say they had us surrounded, the poor bastards. So that was kind of our attitude. But uh, when we moved out into a little hell hole called the Bojock Woods, uh, uh, I had three friends that went back, brothers went back about a year ago in March of one year. And I told them the Bojock is creepy. It's part of the Ardennes in the snow, particularly in the snow. Everything's real quiet. If you've ever read Grimm's fairy tales or old-timey tales like that, you know, that they kind of, that's, I think, where they started. I mean, it's creepy, even without fighting. Well, we moved up into these Bojack woods, and I've started to tell you about my friends that had gone there in March of one year, and it snowed. And they came back and said, you're right, brother. It's creepy even. I mean, man, you just feel chills up and down your back. I mean, all the time. <laughs> I mean, it's cold, sure. But it, you're, you're, you know, you just feel creepy or uh, eerie, I guess is the, the word. But we took this hill in the Bojac, and one thing kind of sticks in your mind that, you know, when you can't dig holes in this hard ground. That one of our tricks was, you know, you find to get a dead crowd and toss him out of the hole and get in that hole, you know, because uh, they dug good holes too, by the way. Well, we ran up on this where this uh, machine gun crew had been knocked out and there were two or three dead there and there was a German medic there and they wore a thing like a apron around, you know, like it had Red Cross on it, on it you know. And this German looked up and saw me and shrugged and turned around and walked off, you know, and your, your old adrenaline's running, you know, but you see these dead craps laying there, so, you know, and you need that hole, <laughs> and so you're not going to shoot a medic anyway. Well, we're very lucky that uh, we were then told, going to turn our platoon, you understand, we were pretty much full strength, and go down this trail and get some tanks that had been mousetrapped in these thicker woods. And as we were going down this trail, here come a tanker. And he wearing that typical old big long hat that had the big old funny looking thing and a jacket and he was shaking, you know. And I says, where are you going to go? Where are you going? He says, I'm going to back and get me another tank. I mean, those guys love that tank, you know. And that's where he was headed. Anyway, we had just barely had swung around into these real thick woods when here came a little German tank and a big German tank. And my friend, it went by us just as we were turning around, and I mounted my machine gun up on a, uh, the roots of a tree had been blown over, and I'd set that up there. And these German infantry were behind the two tanks. And they were saying, cease fire, cease fire. And you know, you're just a lot of surrendering going on. So finally somebody says, let them have it. Well, you can't hardly see in these woods. It's, it's, it's eerie, like I say. Well, the only reason I could see my first target, you very seldom, maybe twice in my life, I've seen, seen the enemy, okay? But it's usually smoke and hollering and screaming and all that. Well, I saw this crowd kid, he had an MG-42, and when he turned his head, the very light flickered off of his helmet. And I started firing. That first tracer went through him, and I could see this whole squad behind him get just killed him. In the meantime, up where the two tanks were, uh, one of my friends had bounced a bazooka round off of it, and uh, the tank commander looked down at him, went back to firing, and the two tanks got on out of there. But we shot up the infantry 
pretty bad. It, uh, we lost some good people there. And uh, Custis Gus Hill was a guy that he went AWOL in church. That was the only time he was ever late. And uh, he shot a whole bunch of guys with us. And then one, John Ophius Bay was killed there. And Goolsby, our medic, was waving a brassard, his medical brassard, at his tank and went out and got John Ophius. You know, so we was pretty pretty hairy there for a while, but we fell on back across the railroad track. By this time, it's like early January, cold, miserable. This is where uh, we supposedly got Christmas dinner, frozen turkey leg and all. But Kyle, I got to tell you, our information was that uh, they were getting the Germans, were getting the SS units out. And they were hitting us with Volk's Grenadier, old men and kids. Okay, you know they came at us again, and we decided to give them that hill. And uh, I remember having a old frozen turkey leg and a piece of shell to half and a machine gun going down this trail trying to eat that turkey leg, <laughs> and that was that was Christmas dinner. And so uh, we uh, got reorganized, started driving towards the Luxembourg border, and. Uh, uh, Probably the happiest sight of my life was 502 was the regiment was attacking on the right. We were on the left. The ground area had kind of opened up. You, know, you could see big open areas. And uh, I remember getting out on a patrol out front and saw the marker for the Luxembourg border in, in this deep snow. And he got back kind of to this reserve area, and my friend Roy Morgan had showed up. And uh, like I say, he got <laughs> he got hit in the butt, and he jumped on a jeep, and and they evacuated him. But uh, uh, that pretty well ended up our killing time in uh, the Ardennes. Uh, we reformed, got on the train, and went to the Colmar Pocket down in Alsace Lorraine. Ran some patrol activities and crossed this little river, the Motor, I think it was, and uh, that uh, we lost to right good many people down there. Some of our, our first sergeant got killed, for example. He, he didn't have to go on this patrol, but he he went, and so uh, we ended up then going to uh, Birch's Garden. And by this time, it's May of 19 April, I guess, of 45. And uh, we went up to the Eagle's Nest and uh, formed up in the, uh, well, the regiment then deactivated uh, from the SS barracks there in Birch's Garden and uh, had to have been about uh, in May, I guess, of 45. Because in the meantime, prior to, you know, between the uh, Colmar Pocket and Birch's Garden, we had gone back to France and our people were on standby to jump on the prison camps and try to hold them to these. Uh, uh, the armor got there, but Patton was always on on our drop zone, and <laughs> so uh, we rejoined the division in Birch's Garden, and uh, that's where we deactivated. And 501 came home by this time, November of '45. By the way, I, you know, when we got back to Marmalon, and went, you know, to to rejoin the division, I had a big medic named uh, Hamrich, Hemlick, Luke, you know, and about this time the. Uh, Point system came out. It's about as fair as you could get it. Okay, Purple Heart was worth five points. You know, I didn't give a damn if I had a Purple Heart or not, but I, I found out you know that it was worth <laughs> worth five points. So I grabbed old Luke and said, "Hey, you remember that? Remember I evacuated me there in Bastogne? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll get you your five points." So I, so I ended up with about eighty-five points, and uh, I briefly had to go with the uh, five hundred two regiment of the Orbs there before I came home with the second group. Of, High point, man. You know the man, uh, family man. You know, like yourself, you'd have 12 points. You see, automatically just for having a kid. You know, so. Uh, but again, the system was about as fair as it uh, it could get. And that uh, in March, uh, excuse me, in November of '45, I uh, returned to the states and got discharged, and I couldn't settle down. I, I, I guess, you know, people say the war does things, and it does. But it, it you know, I. I think I had this wild streak before I, got, you know, I had a good bit of money. I was 19 years old in this little town, and uh, 
to have a bartender in this bar tell me, you know, quit buying booze for these guys. You know, their wives are calling me, and they still talk about that adventure I had for the six months or so I was out. And uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't steal or hurt anybody. But you know, I was just embarrassment to my family and all. And, and somebody mentioned that Eleanor Roosevelt had tried to get up a retraining thing for returnees that. Uh, uh, you know, our way of going into a house was toss in a grenade, kick in the door, and follow it with the Tommy gun. It, you know, it's sort of you know, the way you do things. And uh, I guess I was the poster boy for, for that. I mean, I, I guess I had that wild streak before I went in the service, and it was kind of exacerbated, I, I suppose. And the here today, gone tomorrow attitude, uh, which was kind of exacerbated by my war experiences. I still have that, by the way, shortness of patience and so forth. So that was kind of the effect that it had on me. But I, again, I just I just couldn't settle down uh, in civilian life. And uh, uh, just an embarrassment to my family. That was enough reason to, <laughs> to, to uh, kind of re-enlist. Of course, like I say, my father had died. My mother was living with relatives. and. My brother was in China, so you know it's sort of mixed up situation. But uh, that pretty well ended my World War II experience, and so uh, I went back to jumping out of airplanes. <laughs> Do you know how much more paper there was? Say again? Got a few higher plane kind oh, of okay, questions. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, dear. Um, I guess the tape's still rolling, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you mean we're still on? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I, can see, I can see myself over there. I don't know if I'm, we're on or not. Oh, okay. Um, We're still going. Let, let me have. Uh, let's see. Tell me why you think it was necessary that this country get involved with World War II. Well, Kyle, if we hadn't, we'd have been speaking German or Japanese, and I mean that. Uh, by the same token, also, there's some uh, thought that. Uh, had it not been for World War II, this nation would have gone socialist. Because you understand, we had people like Henry Wallace and uh, all of the uh, alphabet soup of uh, social or, uh, organizations established during the Depression was leading us down the road to socialism. Probably there was a lot of a lot of talk about going socialist, even, well, of course, it goes back to Eugene Debs and the many times he ran for president around World War I. But there was that strong current of socialism which may well have uh, contributed to uh, our, our glide towards socialism had, uh, had it not been for World War II. And there's a, there's a lot, of, lot of truth in that. Uh, as for getting into the war, if uh, we hadn't had a gentleman named uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, who had to do things like uh, give the British a bunch of old four-stack destroyers we had stashed down in Cuba on the Lynn Lease and started this Lynn Lease business. Uh, uh, we wouldn't have been as well prepared as we were. Uh, and I think I mentioned we prepared we were not. Uh, because of that knockout blow they gave us in Pearl Harbor. Uh, at that time, of course, the battleship was the queen of the seas, and uh, that was the Japanese, I understand, their uh, purpose was to knock out the battleship. Fortunately, the carriers escaped, and uh, they were out on maneuvers or something. So, uh, uh, yeah, I have to say it was necessary. If uh, I mean, you know, Kyle, you can you can look at it, and, and probably you ask me, and I'll tell you. I think 
there was a prime minister of Great Britain called Chamberlain, went down to Munich, signed an agreement with Hitler. He come out of the airplane in London when he landed and waving that thing, saying, peace in our time. We can do business with this guy, Hitler. And that's just not true because it wasn't too long after that that we had an old battery radio. And my brother had to get up, you know, like four in the morning to listen to Hitler's speech so he could tell about it in school, okay? And that was a speech that he made about we're going to have peace in our time, we're going to have a piece of Sudetenland, we're going to have a piece of Czechoslovakia, we're going to have a piece of Austria, okay, you know? So he carried on like that. So those madmen that are in the world have to be stopped. And yes, the war was necessary. I mean, if they'd have had things like an atomic bomb, we wouldn't be here. Um, this exhibit and these videos will see, be seen by literally thousands and thousands of school kids. Um, what do you want to tell them and what do you want them to know? <sighs> I guess that uh, I, uh, this is not necessarily based on one of my wartime experiences, but it's a lifetime of experiences, and it probably oversimplifies things. But I often tell the tale of a sainted coach here in the state of Georgia called Irk Russell. He was getting a little bit old to be head coach uh, at the university, so they kept him in the system and moved him, I believe it was to Valdosta, uh, uh, Georgia, one of the southern universities, as head coach. He put out a magnificent team within just a couple of years, a phenomenon. And the TV guys were interviewing these students, these football players, and they asked the student, what does the coach tell you guys that motivates you to get in there and fight like the Dickens for, for, for victory? The kid thought about it for a little while. He says, well, coach said, just do right. And I can't put it any plainer than that. You know the difference between right and wrong. Just do right. And that's what my lifetime of experiences have taught me, is to just do right. Pretty powerful message. I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I don't. Um, of course, the, uh, World War II had a vast influence on the United States. Um, what are a couple are the uh, one or two of the largest, most significant, most far-reaching changes that it had on the nation, in your point of view. On the nation? Mm -hmm. Pretty hard question to answer, except that I just hope that we realize that it's time to stop these madmen before they get started. And in that sense, that a capable civilian controlled armed forces is the only way to go. Uh, hopefully we've learned to do things like, uh, okay, uh, when I was a kid, a boy my age would get in a little bit of trouble and they'd go to court from some misdemeanor. The judge would say, you know, you can go in the army or you can go to jail. Well, I think we've learned a little something about educating our young people and not just for letting them go in the army. I mean, I mean to let them go into the service. Some of these jobs these guys do are, are just, just phenomenal. It takes a lot of brain power. Uh, just this afternoon, a friend of mine called me, wants me to go down in the end of this month to do the help with the best ranger competition. 
these guys set up radios. They not only jump out of airplanes and helicopters and swim and go and do push-ups and march and all the physical thing, it's the brain work that they have. And I think what we've learned is to have not just an available armed service, but to have a, uh, an armed service that's mentally capable of dealing with these problems in the world. So if there's ever any one thing that can't, in other words, you can't go into combat and win with a bunch of trash. You've got to come in with thinking people. I mean, if I got in a tank today and tried to operate a gun sight, I wouldn't know how to do it. So the fact that, speaking for the Army, that they require at least a high school education, and it's all volunteer Army. So if we've ever learned anything, it's to have a ready armed service and to have an educated armed service. Because I don't want to get like we were back in 1939 and 1940, we had a wise man named Will Rogers. Uh, he was telling you about, you know, let's go kill all these guys that are attacking Pearl Harbor and all that stuff. You know, Will Rogers made the comment and says, well, you know, <laughs> we, didn't, we, we had to go to the French to borrow a machine gun because we didn't have one. You know, <laughs> it'd be a little facetious, of course. But you've probably seen films yourself of Louisiana maneuvers back in 1941 where a Jeep would have a sign on it say, tank. And he shows a couple of guys down with a fake uh, wooden machine gun firing and, and all this stuff. We just, we just can't afford to get in that position again. And, of course, the civilian control is an absolute necess necessity for this. For this. Um, <clears throat> Why do you think your generation should be remembered? <laughs> Well, I hope we, I hope we, I hope we've set an example that uh, that you, that you can win. Uh, that uh, we have spread the word that you you can you can you can win, and uh, uh, I I hope that I've been able to get across that the background from which we came, and pretty much well, we all my friends and relatives, we're all poor, uh, and. and agriculture oriented, that if, if we could teach these kids that this thing, you know, can happen, that uh, things like the economy and, and, uh, and the forces in the world, how, that, that we just need to be uh, educated enough to deal with these kind of problems, particularly, particularly the economy, as you're probably well aware in my own opinion, that uh, the e economy was the root of, of World War II. So that if we have an educated citizenry that can look at things like the economy and, and, uh, and uh, just don't repeat the same mistakes that, we, that my generation made. Uh, as for the example of courage and persistence and strength, I think we've already pretty well passed that along to these young men in his ranger competition. Like the young man had invited me to go help him out at the end of this month, or, and he came within 39 points of winning that thing. I mean, they had to, at the end, I mean, there's always a couple of rangers that win it. And this one ranger that won had a, a Marine gunny sergeant, his buddy. And that gunny sergeant said, you know, those guys from the 82nd showed up out of nowhere and they wouldn't go away. And that's the kind of tradition I think we've passed along at least to the armed services. That, uh, uh, that what we have done, they've built on. I, I go out to a drop zone out here in, in uh, Cedartown and these guys come up from Fort Benning. They, you know, they won't tell you where they've been or, you know, or anything. But, you know, I try to tell them, well, you know, you need an ammo bearer. I'll, I'll take me with you. I'll be your ammo bearer. <laughs> because they're so proud of what these young men and women can do. It, it's just, uh, it's, it's surprising. And again, it's part of the thought process and, 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 and uh, uh, nation building. And uh, that's what I'd like to pass along on, to these young people. And I hope it's not been in vain. <laughs> uh, I hope that they develop a, a love of country and be able to criticize it uh, when it needs it and serve when they need it. And that's pretty well what it taught me. Okay. Is there anything we haven't covered that you wanted to discuss or say? Well, not not really. I I 
go to these classes and so forth and you know we're we're a dwindling kind of part of our population myself included I'm 78 now and uh, like I say I plan to go back to Normandy and uh, make another at least one more jump and uh, and they're my French friends and uh, make one more tour of Europe and uh, get back home and uh, sort of play like I'm retired. <laughs> but, uh, I just hope that we can have peace in our time, Kyle. Uh, but you can't have peace as long as these madmen are running the world. All right. Okay. That will be, that's more than perfect. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. I hope you guys didn't get bored. Don't you know it's quitting time? Huh? Didn't I tell you what the 11th commandment is? The 11th commandment is do not be late for quitting time. <laughs> Kyle, enjoyed it. Oh, I'm getting stiff. Whoops. I'm, uh oh, I'm hooked up here. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. I was about to move out. Where did he put me? Ah, oh, oh, okay. Do you need to unzip? Uh, the things just need to come under your collar. Oh, okay, got you covered. How about that? All right, okay. All right, you're free. All right, am I free? Okay. Well, Kyle, I wish you well in your, uh, let's see, when's your next big ceremony of the uh, dedication uh, end of May? No, here, here. I'm actually going to talk. You want me at the round table? Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna speak. They won't let me have the 30 minutes to leave. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're going to give me about five or ten just talking about where. I'm